Hello. 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 Right. Okay, hold on. Let me start the share. There we go. Uh, does that look right? Yes, perfect. Yes, perfect. So good. Okay, so good. And take it away. Take right. it away. Okay, good. Right. Um, okay, thank you for the organizers to invite me here today to speak. Um, and hello, everyone. My name is Yu Zheng. And today I will talk to you about epilepsy. And uh, I think I will briefly introduce epilepsy for those who don't know uh, the disease very well. Um, and it's essentially a neurological condition that's characterized by unprovoked sudden seizures. And it affects actually um, basically 1% of the population. And of those 50 million people worldwide, about 30% are currently not responding to treatment. So there's definitely a significant financial and also a human need to really investigate this disease. And uh, you might ask, well, how are seizures then measured and how do they look like? Um, seizures are actually measured using uh, EEG. And this could be, for example, I will switch my laser pointer on as well. Uh, this could be um, scalp EEG, uh, as you might uh, be familiar with. Um, but you, could, you may also use uh, in, uh, subdural or intracranial EEG. These are uh, electrodes that are placed directly on top of the brain. And these are typically recording from the patient for anywhere between three to uh, 14 days. And the seizure then looks like something like this on the EEG. So these are uh, very clear high amplitude activities um, that basically appear on the EEG. And in this example, the seizures that kind of starts in these channels and then gradually kind of spreads to the surrounding uh, channels as well. So today I will focus on focal onset seizures. And these are seizures that I've uh, shown in the previous example, which basically start in a particular location in the brain. And I will also focus on human epilepsy and essentially trying to, uh, well, see if we can understand focal um, onset seizures in humans through computational methods. Uh, my talk has three parts. And in the first part, I will be talking about the modeling of a local signal or local EEG signal first. And this is because in the epilepsy literature, when you read it, there's actually a really interesting um, observation, which is basically that all or the majority of focal seizures start uh, in a channel and they start as in one of two ways, essentially. Uh, one very typical way in which seizures can start is this sort of activity where there is a kind of a slow buildup in amplitude and uh, the activity is typically very fast, which is why also this uh, seizure onset pattern here is usually termed the low voltage fast onset pattern. And uh, the second type um, of onset pattern that typically uh, one can observe are these kind of high amplitudes. So it basically immediately starts with a fairly high amplitude, but a slower frequency um, oscillation. And this is interesting because uh, if you think about it, out of all the possibilities in which a seizure can start, they tend to fall into one of these two categories, which indicates that there is uh, some mechanism underlying it uh, that we can maybe try and understand. I apologize for the siren in the background. <laughs> um, and the way um, I decided to look into this is using a computational model. And in this case, because I'm modeling uh, a single kind of electrode activity, I decided to focus on uh, simulating a local cortical patch. And the most local cortical patch in this model consists of cortical columns, and cortical columns are modeled by a neuropopulation model of an excitatory inhibitory population, uh, formulated in this case in the wilson cowan formalism. Um, the, all of the, the details you'll be able to see uh, in the corresponding publication, which are uh, linked below. And in this model, basically, uh, we then couple up these uh, uh, columns to form a cortical sheet and we essentially can simulate activity on this sheet. And here's an example output of uh, the model. So it starts with some kind of, oops, it starts with uh, some, wait, hold on, let's see. Yeah, it starts with some uh, low uh, level fluctuations simulating the background. And then here the seizure gets initiated and then spreads to the entire simulated sheet. And so here you see an example of basically background activity as well as uh, seizure activity being possible in this model. Uh, to simulate then what, the, what one would see from a clinical electrode, uh, I essentially just average uh, the signal from the simulated cortical sheet to simulate a single time series, which corresponds to a single EEG trace. Uh, using this method, uh, 
I managed to find, uh, of course, these low voltage fast onset type patterns in the model that resemble the clinical recording very well. So there's some kind of uh, initially very low uh, amplitude, but uh, faster oscillations that gradually evolve into uh, slow oscillations of high amplitude. Now, the interesting thing in this, uh, in this uh, is that what does it actually look like in terms of the spatial temporal activities on the simulated patch and in this case we can see that um, essentially it starts it appears to start with a couple of local activations in this uh, in this sheet and uh, they gradually over a very long period of time here like two seconds have elapsed they very gradually recruit the surrounding and hence this build up in amplitude here and once they've recruited the entire sheet that's uh, at the point when these uh, larger amplitude oscillations arise Okay, so this is the first type um, of onset that we observe in the clinical as well as in the model. Uh, the second type, these high voltage uh, onset patterns, we also observe in the model that resemble again the clinical recordings. And in this case, the um, spatial temporal activity is uh, very different. So what happens is within a very short period, um, this one seizure initiation point seems to recruit the surrounding extremely quickly. So here uh, it's on the scale of milliseconds, it's 400 milliseconds that this recruitment has ha happened as opposed to the previous pattern. So that was interesting and we decided to look at, well, what parameter governs uh, which type of onset pattern we observe in the model. And one of the uh, parameters that stood out was this, uh, we called it surround excitability, it's essentially just how uh, much how much excitability each uh, of these columns uh, is set in, or if you know the word cow model, it's essentially the P parameter. Um, and we saw that uh, essentially at very um, kind of higher levels of this parameter, we tend to see these higher amplitude, but slower oscillations, but at lower levels of surround excitability, we tend to see faster uh, sorry, faster oscillations at uh, lower amplitudes. So basically, these at this end we see this low voltage fast pattern, and at this end we see this high amplitude pattern. And when we investigated it even a bit even further, it, we saw essentially that in the model there's actually a bistable region. So what that means is that in this region, uh, the normal state uh, co coexists with the seizure state in the model, which is why the recruitment can happen very fast if, if it's uh, set off. Uh, which is why we see immediately this uh, high amplitude onset. Whereas uh, in this part of the parameter space, uh, we only have the normal state. There's no corresponding seizure state, and the seizure state essentially has to be created um, through these local patches that gradually start to recruit um, the, the, the sheet. So a quick interim conclusion on this part. Um, there the are two main focal seizure onset patterns that can be identified uh, from clinical literature. And our model suggests that these two different onset patterns might be associated with fundamentally different settings of cortical excitability. Um, this is also supported by actually some, or verified by some observations uh, in the literature, which I'll not go into detail to, uh, but uh, please feel free to read it up in the publication. Um, but what I really want to, why I'm showing you this, is because I think it actually um, is a nice introduction to a larger picture that I'm trying to paint. So this work is in line with this idea that there is this, this cort cortical excitability that continuously changes in time and space, much like uh, waves, uh, ocean waves uh, <laughs> on the brain, essentially. Um, and the literature suggests that these sp spatial temporal changes modulate and dictate how epileptic activity appears. And uh, I've put a couple of citations here that uh, I think are really nice uh, papers that also kind of further support this, or if you want further reading on this uh, kind of bigger picture. So with this bigger picture in mind, we asked the question, well, can we go a bit further? And so far we've uh, considered only univariate uh, kind of frequency domain properties of a single EEG channel and explained it with a computational model. That's nice, but uh, if this ever-changing excitability uh, model in time and space is true, then we would expect that uh, spatially that there are wide-ranging effects of these uh, ever-changing excitability and that they would affect spatial temporal network dynamics as well in seizures. And the other thing we've not considered is also this, that there should be within subject variability which would arise if these uh, ever-changing excitability levels uh, dynamically change over time. Right? 
And at this stage, we realized what was needed is actually an objective quantification of seizure network dynamics within subjects. And this is exactly uh, leading me to part two of this talk. And uh, just to point out, this, pa um, this paper we recently uh, got published, and uh, this is led by one of my PhD students, very talented PhD student, Gabriel. And uh, what we decide to investigate here is to look at these intracranial re recordings in more detail. What we, uh, we included 31 subjects in this study. Uh, they were obtained from the IEG portal and from uh, collaborators at UCLH. The recordings lasted anywhere between 43 to 382 hours, and there were six seizures per subject at minimum, on an average 16.5 seizures per subject, and in total we investigated 511 seizures. Right. So with this wealth of seizures, uh, what we decided to do with the data is to take a functional network analysis approach uh, and essentially do a sliding window functional connectivity uh, analysis. And so we put a 10 second sliding window over all the seizures and obtained um, essentially uh, functional connectivities on, in six different frequency bands. And from this data, uh, we decided that this was way too many dimensions to visualize. And so we embedded it in a um, lower dimensional, two dimensional representation using MDS, which we've seen a couple of times at this uh, conference, I think, already. And what that means is it allows us to visualize seizures um, or window, time windows in seizures as data points. And so the need time window corresponds to a single data point. And time windows, which are more, which have more similar network dynamics, are placed uh, closer together. And time windows with more dissimilar or more different network dynamics are placed further apart. And uh, a seizure or a network evolution of each seizure forms a pathway through the space. And I'll show you this in a, uh, in, a in a patient using real patient data now. So these are the seizure pathways visualized for one patient and. Uh, in this patient, we've uh, essentially highlighted a couple of their seizures. So for example, seizure, seizure two here, its pathway starts here and kind of uh, stays relatively local in this area. Um, seizure 10 here, again, is a seizure that starts here, but uh, doesn't really evolve much in terms of network dynamics. Um, but for example, seizure eight is a seizure that starts here, kind of goes down to this part of network space and then comes back again. Uh, what this uh, representation or what this thinking about pathways allows us to do is to compare pathways now. That means we can actually now start to compare seizure dynamics or seizure evolutions. And using a method called dynamic time warping, we essentially managed to derive what we call a seizure dissimilarity matrix. So this is essentially a matrix that captures how different seizures are. And I'll walk you through the details of this now. So if we focus on seizure 8 and seizure 6, these two seizures, uh, their pathways look extremely similar and overlap in large parts. So you would expect the seizure dissimilarity to be very low, and this is indeed the case. So here, so that corresponds to this entry here in the dissimilarity matrix. And if you look at seizure 2 versus seizure 10, uh, we know they're placed very far apart, so their dynamics would have been very different, and their dissimilarity indeed is also very different. And this corresponds to this entry here in this matrix. And if we now look at an intermediate case, seizure 8 and 9, they share some parts with overlapping pathways, but then there are also parts of the pathway that are very distinct, and that resulted in an intermediate level of dissimilarity in this matrix um, corresponding to this entry here. So now that we can actually quantify uh, how similar seizures are, we thought to ask the question, well, the, but how does this similarity, how, do, how does that change over time? And uh, we can see um, if we just plot out these pathways uh, in, uh, in the order when the seizures occurred, we can already see that the first seizure through to the 11th seizure seems to drift over time in its pathway, which suggests that there is a slow temporal drift. And indeed, if we then look at it in terms of when those seizures occurred exactly, so these two seizures occurred very close together, uh, these three occurred very close together, uh, and then the rest uh, occurred afterwards. And what we also see is that essentially, you know, we can already see an intuition there that kind of seizures that occur closer together in time also seem to be more similar to each other. And we quantified exactly this by uh, looking at the seizure dissimilarity matrix and the uh, temporal distance essentially of when those seizures occurred and how far apart they occurred. And we correlated them 
and indeed observed a uh, significant correlation between those two things, again indicating that seizures that occur closer together in time seem to be more similar in their dynamics. And this also held true for across uh, all the subjects that we investigated. For the majority of subjects, we actually got a significant correlation. And overall, this distribution is uh, positively shifted in terms of the correlation coefficient. And I won't go into the detail of how we did this, but essentially what we then asked is, can we describe the change in time a bit better? And indeed, we could characterize most of the patients in, into either the category of a linear underlying change uh, in their seizure pathways, or a circadian underlying change, or a linear plus circadian um, change in their seizure pathways. OK, so as a quick conclusion on this part as well, Within the same patient, we essentially observe a spectrum of different uh, seizures with different uh, network dynamics or pathways. And seizures tend to be more similar if they occur closer together in time in the majority of patients. And these changes can be explained by circadian or linear changes of an underlying modulator in the majority of patients. And at this stage, we also again ask the question, well, um, that is very nice, um, but can we go a bit further? And if the seizure modulators uh, change slowly over time and in space, which is uh, the big picture I pitched, uh, we must see some evidence of this in the interictal, uh, which is the non-seizure essentially recording. And this is, leads me essentially to the third part uh, of this talk. Um, this is some preliminary results that we haven't published yet. It's in preparation. And uh, what we decided to do there is to take the entire uh, intracranial recording and again do a sliding window approach but with a slightly larger window this time and to essentially analyze the complete times so this time is actually over several days that you see here and we essentially observe the uh, in this case the band power fluctuations over several days uh, in different channels and in frequency bands and what we did is uh, after some dimensionality reduction under a method called empirical mode decomposition which um, decomposes all signals into fluctuations on different time scales. what we ended up with for this example patient is that, um, so this is again time scale of uh, six days, uh, what we ended up with is fluctuations in this patient in the band power over different time scales. And what we can see very clearly is, for example, that there is a time scale that corresponds to essentially a circadian oscillation. There are also some fairly high amplitude oscillations kind of a bit faster and a little bit slower as well. And now that we've characterized essentially fluctuations of band power on different time scales, we ask the question, well, do these fluctuations explain anything about the seizures? And so we essentially applied the same measure of seizure dissimilarity in another example patient here. And in this example patient, I picked mainly because it's so easy to see what's going on here. Um, in this example patient had five seizures and four of those seizures are extremely similar. They basically share this large pathway here, except for one seizure, which is this one in dark blue here, seizure number three, and it essentially stays local. And therefore it has a very um, different, so a large, uh, very, very dissimilar to all the other seizures, which is why the seizure dissimilarity here basically looks like a cross. Okay, um, and then if we look at one of those uh, fluctuations that I showed you earlier for this patient, what we see is that most seizures in this patient happen um, at when the fluctuation is essentially zero. So this is the continuous fluctuation of the band power, and we see this seizure occurred here at about zero. Here, this second seizure also occurred at zero. The third seizure, which is the one odd one out, actually occurred at a slightly higher value, and then the other ones again at nearly zero. Um, so based on that, we can essentially derive another uh, distance matrix, which tells us essentially how far apart these data points are from each other in terms of this fluctuation. And we see that it, it essentially gives the same structure as uh, this matrix. So it's then obvious that if we correlate one against the other, it achieves a very good uh, explanation of this CG dissimilarity matrix. We repeated this so far in just over a handful of patients. and. Uh, uh, what we see is, uh, so this is the essentially how well uh, these IMFs can explain the seizure dissimilarity. And in most patients, it achieves a reasonable explanation of the seizure dissimilarity. So again, of course, not everything is explained perfectly, but there is uh, clearly something already contained in this uh, interictal data. 
I also just quickly want to point out um, some other literature in this direction, uh, other people that have investigated other features, other properties, um, and I think there really is um, something to be um, gained from looking at these uh, long-term recordings in a continuous fashion. Okay, so then as a, as a kind of a big picture summary of, uh, of everything I've presented so far, um, essentially, from this idea that there is uh, cortical excitability changes uh, continuously over time and space, much like waves, then uh, we essentially deduced that there must be some changes in the seizure dynamics as well, which is indeed what we observed uh, in all patients. And uh, we then also from that deduce that there must be some underlying modulators of this change. Um, some of them might be kind of a very slow gradual change. Others might be kind of on a circadian time scale or different time scales. And this, this all seems to hold true. And the uh, really, I guess the question at this stage is if we can understand and untangle what those modulatory factors are, or we might be able to do that directly through uh, looking at the interictal recordings, we could actually maybe imagine to control seizures uh, in reverse. So if we can control these factors, we could maybe control seizures such that they don't change into particular types of seizures that we might not want because they're particularly detrimental for the patient, uh, into types of seizures that are less uh, impactful to the patient in their life. So this is a summary, but of course there are many open questions. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, I've just picked out a few here, but uh, um, of course, uh, the one question we are very often get is how do these results hold over longer time scales? And this is indeed something that we're currently investigating using the uh, NeuroVista data. Um, and another question is, well, it's nice that you've investigated kind of this large scale network dynamics, but how do specific seizure features actually change over time, right? So seizure features could be seizure duration, seizure onset patterns, spread, etc. And uh, can we predict these uh, seizure fi features in some way, like using interictal data or short periods of preictal data? And uh, of course, we need to bear in mind that all of this variability, or even this ever-changing cortical excitability idea, it all arises against a fixed structural underpinning. And the question there really is then, how does this fixed structural underpinning um, kind of determine or limit uh, these fluctuations? And I think some of the talks earlier might uh, might be a good starting point for this. Um, and of course, as, as the most important part really is what are actually the implications for treatment of this uh, ever-changing cortical excitability. Uh, I mentioned uh, in the last slide that uh, you know if we could control some of these modulators, then that might be a way of kind of a normal way of treating epilepsy. Uh, but of course, we also need to bear in mind what uh, this ever-changing or continually changing fluctuations mean for uh, interventions or treatments that are static, like epilepsy surgery. Uh, I don't really have time to go into this, but uh, we started looking into this a little bit in a, pre uh, in a paper we published this year, but I think there is really a lot more to do there still. Uh, yeah, etc, etc. So I think uh, this talk really is probably just uh, whetting your appetite for that this idea of an ever-changing cortical excitability is really attractive for understanding seizures and their variabilities within and probably also between patients, and that they might offer some solutions to uh, treating epilepsy better. Um, just to conclude, um, if you're interested in any of the data or the code, um, please check our lab website. We also have a lab GitHub. Um, the most of the data, actually all of the data that I've uh, presented today are published with the nodal links in the associated publications and if you still can't find something feel free to contact me. And finally just to acknowledge uh, really Gabriel who led the uh, first study on seizure dissimilarity and Mariella who's currently leading the study on the interictal data and a lot of collaborators at Newcastle and uh, UCL Hospital. And also special thanks for patients who contributed their data to this research um, and a couple of centers that contributed the data and really IEG portal, which is a great uh, resource uh, or has been a great resource for us over the years. Uh, yeah, and a bit more contact data there uh, if you want. Yeah, thank you very much. Cool. Thank you. Great talk. Great talk. Uh, questions. questions. So a little bit of time. time. So. so 
Chang Song asks, which parameters are changed in the simulation to induce large oscillations? So in the, um, this is probably referring to the first part of the talk, um, yep. where yep. it gradually changed from a small to a large um, uh, oscillation. In that, there was no underlying parameter change. So it was essentially initiated at a, a, a steady state, um, but given a small pulse, and that small pulse was sufficient to trigger the subsequent uh, recruitments, essentially. So there was no, there, there wasn't a uh, parameter change over the course of the simulation. It was a change either at the start of the simulation um, or at, in the starting si uh, parts of the simulation. But it wasn't that uh, the large amplitude was introduced because I changed a large parameter uh, to a different value. So is it a bi-stable switching, switching mechanism? Exactly. mechanism? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that was uh, driving this. Yeah. Yep. And Katerina asks, asks, could this method of measuring similarity between traces be used to compare evoked activity between healthy subjects and conditions, for instance, to explain reaction times? Yeah, I think so, absolutely. So the, the reason, I think one of the big challenges I've kind of glossed over that we faced uh, with uh, comparing seizures was that they were of different lengths, so you can't really just compare them by subtracting them, uh, which is why we needed the dynamic time warping method. And the other aspect was that seizures, when you look at them, they actually have something like what's often called elastic properties. So, you know, one part of a seizure might last a bit longer in one seizure than the other. And you really want to, if you want to do this fairly, you want to compare kind of the elastic changes. And that's why, again, we apply dynamic time warping. And I'd imagine something very similar probably could be applied to, uh, yeah, short events or shorter events uh, like evoke potentials, but also interictal spikes probably. And um, other events that kind of have this property that they're differing duration or slightly different duration, but you kind of want to match up certain aspects of them in time. Uh, uh, I guess there does seem to be a lot of echo. echo. Maybe, Maybe your speaker is not, not, I don't know. I don't know. Um, um, so sorry for, sorry for that, everyone. We'll quickly ask one more question. One more question. Uh, uh, do you have any intuition of how the modulators evolved during the electrogenesis period before the first spontaneous seizure? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, the simple answer is no. I know some people who are working on it, <laughs> um, but I, I don't think I have a kind of a big picture pitch that I can that I can necessarily tell you. Other than that, I think um, I think a lot of healthy processes or usually healthy processes in people without epilepsy actually additionally contribute to the epileptogenesis. So things that uh, would normally in a healthy person go correctly and lead to developmental uh, expansion or pruning or other processes, uh, I think they actually are probably hijacked and become contributors to the epileptic process and contribute to modulating epilepsy later on as well. So I think there is actually a really interesting interplay between things that usually you would think of as healthy processes that interact directly with the epilepsy. Well, one quick one, because it's Sebastian, and I always see Sebastian in there. So do you use any metric to compare clinical versus simulated traces? Slide 15. It's slide 15. Ah, yes. Uh, so that the the trace directly I didn't comp compare, but we compared the frequency content and the amplitude, and that was two very simple metrics we applied. I think actually I might have in the supplementary also applied some other metrics. Uh, yeah, have a look at the supplementary, but uh, mainly it was amplitude and frequency in the main text of comparison. Cool. Um, well, thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank the you. last question will have to go to the nearest uh, So thank you again. Now, thank you very much. Uh, we invite.